Ja, nu tror jag att det är dags att börja. Klockan är nio prick. Eh, varmt välkomna till Digikults andra dag. And of course an extra warm and extended welcome to our international guests. Under gårdagen så fick vi följa flera olika perspektiv på hur kulturarvet inte bara kan definieras och problematiseras. Exempelvis genom Johan Lindbloms presentation. Utan också att det på olika vis kan omsättas i praktiken. Katti Hovlin som inledningstalare lyfter fram handens och beröringens nödvändighet och betydelse i en digital samtid. Hur det digitala kan föda en analog, analog nostalgi. Men det fanns också presentationer som lyfter fram hur det digitala gränssnittet kan göra precis det. Genom aktiverade kroppsliga och multisensoriska. Och då tänker jag på Tims presentation om touchy feel tech och Fredrik Gunnarssons om att skapa presence eller närvaro i de digitala gränssnitt. Jag nämnde igår hur just definitionen av gränssnitt när det dyker upp i de engelska ordlistorna i mitten av 1800-talet innefattar en organisk syn på relationen mellan två kroppar eller ytor. De stöts mot varandra, påverkar varandra. Och det fanns en performativ, en sorts iscensättningsdimension som tycks försvunnit i takt med den ökade digitaliseringen. Då gränssnittet i våra ordlistor i det sena 1900-talet enbart syftar till datorns gränssnitt mot en användare. Men det tycks mig, och inte minst i skenet av de presentationerna som var igår, som de nya digitala teknikerna, exempelvis då VR och AR, med sin multisensoriska potential, kan iscensätta och lyfta fram just den här performativa kroppsliga aktiviteten på nya sätt. Så vi kanske skulle blicka tillbaka historiskt lite oftare. Men i fokus stod också en rad olika typer av kulturarv, texter, artefakter och inte minst audiovisuellt material. Vad och hur ska vi bevara dessa? Liksom hur de kan presenteras, aktiveras och förmedlas på nya sätt. Och inte minst då med tanke på nya typer av samverkan när allmänheten tar en allt mer aktiv del. Men också man kan finna former för inte enbart presenterat material utan också skapa nya typer av iscensättningar som genererar nya forskningsfrågor. Något vi såg ett jättefint exempel på i Trond Lödens presentation. Idag kommer vi, precis som igår, att röra oss över en rad olika perspektiv och materialiteter. Museipraktiker, textpraktiker, arkeologi, AI, sociala medier med mera. Och jag ska alldeles strax introducera dagens första talare, men först, precis som igår, lite praktisk information. Det har tillkommit en del nya eh, gäster. Allra först så vill jag presentera programgruppen, eller jag vill be programgruppen, de ansvariga för Digikult, hjärnorna bakom årets Digikult, att resa sig upp. Jag tycker vi ger dem en applåd. Ställ gärna frågor till dem, ge gärna feedback direkt på plats eller kontakta dem efteråt. Den andra praktiska informationen är utrymningsvägarna. Man känner sig alltid lite som en flygvardina, jag ville bli det när jag var liten. Så vi har fem nödutgångar åt detta hållet, en uppe, två på sidorna, uppe och två där nere. Sen finns det fyra här bak. Kapprummen finns till vänster utanför här. Toaletterna, herrarnas till vänster, damernas till höger. Eh, ladda gärna ner appen som heter VGR Möten i App Store. Där kan ni se programmet och få praktisk information. Och precis som igår, det twittrades ganska mycket, så får ni gärna twittra under hashtaggen Digikult och samma hashtag gäller för Instagram. Precis som igår så är inloggningsuppgifterna till nätverket Digikult 2018, lösenordet är Digikult. Och vi fotograferar även idag och vill man inte vara med på bild så är det väldigt bra om ni säger ifrån. Filmar gör vi också så att ni kan se föredragen efteråt. Vi kan ju börja tala om slutet nu så att jag vill be er efter konferensens slut idag klockan fyra att när ni lämnar lokalen att ni också lämnar era name tags i foajén. Då är jag, vill jag presentera vår första talare. För dagen. Nej, en sak vill jag säga. Den här är upphittad. Om det är någon som känner igen den här anteckningsboken så kan ni komma fram till mig så får ni den. Uh, so now I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker. Yes. Thanks. 
Michael Edson, he's co-founder and associate director and head of digital of Museum of, for the United Nations. And today he will talk about head, heart and hands, building a new global museum from the bottom up. Welcome. Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, hello. I'm Michael Edson. I'm the uh, co-founder of this new thing, the Museum for the United Nations-UN Live, which we think of as a new, a new global thing, museum, to connect people everywhere to the work and mission values of the United Nations and catalyze global effort towards achieving its goals. It's a very small startup NGO close to, but not part of the UN, with a very audacious big goal mission. And over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to try and bring you a little inside the process of creating this institution, because I think what we're trying to do has a very strong intersection with many of the challenges that you're addressing in your institutions. Um, how to work at a big global scale while also being intimate and serving people in their local communities. Um, how to work quickly but not with too much haste. And how to address hmm, the deficiencies, the shortcomings of institutions that were forged and founded in the 20th or 19th or 18th or 17th centuries to solve the last century's problems when we're living in a very different kind of world today. So I'll be very informal. I'm going to try and finish in half an hour and have plenty of time for questions. Uh, but first, we're going to play a game of rock, paper, scissors. Do you play that game in Sweden? Yeah, yeah? okay, so everybody up. <laughs> and face a partner. And you know how you go, you go one, two, three, shoot. Okay, so play. If, if there's a tie, keep going until you have a winner. The loser sits down, the winner finds a new, a new competitor. If you don't know how to play, you need to ask someone. We have winners over there. So find someone, yes. <laughs> Ask a friend. If you win, find someone else who's still standing. We have winners here. Oh, thanks for the house lights. It's getting close. Oh, it's getting really tense down there. Wait, who won? Who's still standing? If you haven't lost, you need to stand up. We need one winner. There we go. You two. Okay, let's have it. Go ahead. You two. Oh, still, wait. One, two. Scissors, scissors. Oh, the tension's unbearable. Scissors wins. Wait, stay standing. You two. For the, for the Digicult 2018 Rock, Paper, Scissors Championship. Scissors wins. Well done. That was outstanding. Um, but I want you uh, to take a glimpse at the future here. This is... best rock, paper, scissors player is a robot. <laughs> Meet your new robot overlords. So what's happening here, and this is already a few years old, it's much, much faster now, is um, researchers in uh, Tokyo have uh, used a video sensor and obviously high-speed processor that can sense what you're going to vote before you're even done doing it. 
and then make the robot react. That whole reaction that the robot does takes maybe two milliseconds. You can't even perceive your own vote in less than 30 or 40 or 50 milliseconds. And it just keeps getting faster and faster and faster. And there's, there are a few lessons or parables in this, in this exercise that we've, we've done. Um, the first is that the future is happening faster and faster and faster. And things that seemed impossible or improbable are now happening with tremendous reliability day and day and day and day out. Uh, but, and yet our institutions and our work is kind of set and adjusted to work at a much slower, more patient speed than that. The innovation and discovery didn't used to happen this quickly. Um, another reason I sort of did this this morning is, is to make a point about play and conviviality. Uh, we're used to coming and there's the speaker on the stage, the authority, and then there's everyone else, the passive audience. Um, and uh, researchers have found that when people engage in play, uh, two creative teams side by side, one team watches a drama before they do their day's work and another watches a comedy. The group that watches a comedy, or even better, the group that participates in comedy, far outperforms the other group every time. It seems there's something intrinsic about play that connects parts of the brain that are often work separately when you just ask people to solve problems. Um, the other thing is about conviviality. Um, institutions have gotten very good about at doing things where the audience comes and goes like this to the stage. Uh, the director of Copenhagen Public Library said they can do programs all day long where the audience comes and, and interacts with the performer. Now they're trying to do things where the audience reacts and responds to each other. And in asking people to play a game like this, you've faced each other. You're a very happy, connected crowd to begin with. But you've faced each other, your heart is going, you have to read each other's body language. There's a whole set of senses and engagement there that's often left out of the equation when we try and solve big global problems, like the Sustainable Development Goals. So I was sitting in my office at the Smithsonian Institution uh, a few years ago, 2015, and I'd been working there for 25 years. I started at the Smithsonian cleaning plexiglass in 1990. Uh, I was a starving artist, a painter and a printmaker, and that was the best job I thought I would ever get. Uh, and in many ways, it still is the best job I've ever had. Um, spending hours and hours and hours in exhibition rooms, uh, just me and the objects, polishing, like the Karate Kid, if you know that movie, Wax On, Wax Off. Uh, it was a great job, but like many of my friends at the time, when technology started getting interesting, we got drawn to it. Uh, I remember after cleaning plexiglass, I started doing exhibition lighting design, and I was on a ladder focusing lights in an exhibit about uh, ancient Japan, and the guest curator was bringing docents, educators, in to learn about the exhibition before we opened. And she spent 45 minutes lecturing about a little tiny wall label, maybe 100 words, 45 minutes talking about the peopling of the Japanese archipelago 20,000 years ago. And it was spellbinding. And then they went to the next room, and pretty much everything that curator knew and cared about, all of the passion, all of the intelligence, just evaporated into space like waste heat, never to be recovered again. Uh, and it occurred to me that there must be a way to begin capturing that moment, or amplifying it, or supporting it, or having more of that kind of convivial, directed uh, engagement in an institution. So one thing led to another, and eventually I wound up as the director of web and new media strategy at the Smithsonian, trying to figure out how we could take this gigantic institution, one of 30 or 40,000 museums in the United States, how we could take them and begin to, to do the work of society, to build a stronger, more intelligent civilization, more connected, more engaged, um, using the tools of culture, language at a global scale, at a, at a global speed. So here we are. How would one begin to do this work? The, the beginning concept for the museum for the United Nations UN Live is 
it rose from a group of people who were working in international development, consultants, working at the UN, trying to figure out why, why was it so hard to achieve global goals. And very early on in their thinking, they weren't museum or cultural people like you are. Um, but very early in their thinking, they thought maybe a museum would be a way to bring new kinds of people together to do important, impactful work. They weren't really sure what that formula would look like, but it seemed like a good idea. They started talking to their friends and their networks, and nobody said no, and a lot of people were intrigued. And when I came into the project, we started working on the core mission of the institution. What are we going to be about? And we came up with this phrase, to connect people everywhere. That's nice. Connection, it's a good verb. Who, who are we connecting? People, what kind of people? People everywhere. To the work and values of the UN. Not the UN, but its work and its values. The UN, the charter of the UN begins with the phrase, we the peoples. Often many of you who work in open access and work with the public have talked about uh, the collections belong to the people. The global goals belong to everyone. So connect the work and values of the United Nations. Uh, connect people everywhere to the work and values of the United Nations and dot, dot, dot. Here's the really important part. Catalyze, stimulate, create, support. Global effort towards achieving its goals. That's the really important part, and I'll get into that a little later. So it's not just the connections, not just teaching, not just raising awareness, but that second part, catalyzing effort. We think of ourselves as a museum on three platforms, co-equally. Digital, of course. And I love my colleagues when I came into the project. They had already jumped over the fact of, of sort of having, you need to have a physical museum, of course, but the real action's gonna be with the digital. So three platforms. A digital platform, a network of partner institutions, local public spaces, uh, members all over the world, and a physical museum headquarters, civic house in Copenhagen, Denmark, and eventually anywhere in the world that needs one. If the project didn't make sense to me if it was just Copenhagen, but when it was Copenhagen and Rio de Janeiro and Jakarta and Buenos Aires and Berlin, then it starts to make sense as a global institution. So three platforms together. And I thought that was kind of both obvious, like of course, three platforms, of course you would start this thing on three platforms together, and also very daring and visionary, we would, go, we would go to the UN, we would meet with partners and we'd say, three platforms together, and they'd go, whoa, that's, what are you smoking? Three platforms together, that's amazing. Um, uh, so this is part of our core uh, value proposition, to do these things together, which raises interesting questions that are on all of your minds about how we connect digital experiences with physical real world experiences. Um, so a museum on three platforms. <laughs> We've struggled with the idea of why we're a museum. So why a museum? Why call it a museum? I think deep in its heart, UN Live wants, it has the soul of a great public library, one of those great civic houses you walk into. The first one that pops into mind is the one in Amsterdam, where everyone, it's there for the people. People are lined up, people of all colors and ages are lined up to, to um, let the library help make, give them superpowers every morning. That's the kind of institution I think we want to build. But this word museum, I struggled with. Uh, what, what is it, is that a limiting word? I know from some of the workshops we've done in Rio de Janeiro and Ethiopia that the word museum is not a universally loved idea. Um, part of uh, what's exciting about having a museum for the United Nations is <laughs> If you take the Universal Declaration of Human Rights literally, which you should, it's an amazing document, everyone in the world has a right to be a part of this. Um, starting with that as a design concept, is, it makes me weak in the knees to think about it, but it starts, you start to ask questions about some of the terms that we take for granted in Europe and North America, museum, 
to most people, <clears throat> particularly post-colonial societies, a museum is a place where the colonial authority t tells you propaganda about what they want you to believe about culture. Um, and that's certainly not what we intend to do. And I was stuck here. Why a museum? And I did a, a workshop in Bilund, Denmark, the headquarters of Lego, uh, with 10 to 12-year-olds and 12 to 14-year-olds, uh, using a Lego methodology, Lego serious play. So I asked the kids, um, build me a Lego model of a great day you had with your family. Oh, okay. And they start the bricks, the sound of the bricks going. I wanted to see sort of if I backed them into the idea of this global institution without using the word museum, what would they build? What would they think about? So each, the kids built these wonderful models of vacation days and days to Tivoli uh, in Copenhagen and trips they'd taken, trips to the park. And then the next question I asked them was, um, modify that model, but make the model this place that you went with your family. It's about being a good person. It's about making the world better. They're like, oh, okay. They went and they build models, they build models, they build models. And then the last question was, this place is a museum for everyone. It's a museum for humanity, and you work there. It's 2025. Take your family on a tour. Build a model of this museum of the future. You, it's yours. And they built these models, and they built these models. But I couldn't help but feel that when I used the word museum, they kind of they looked tired. <laughs> um, they sort of, all of a sudden there was this expectation. It was like, um, have you ever noticed that in great children's literature, the parents are never there? Like in Pippi, Pippi is a hero of, of mine, of ours. Um, Pippi is, is wonderful. Her, she's, no one's, you know, no one's there looking. It's not about her relationship with the parent, it's about her in the world. The Harry Potter stories are the same way. Um, it only gets interesting when the parents are away. And actually, the, the, the authority figures, my daughter tells me, are all horrible authority figures in those books, the Harry Potter books. They're just terrible. Um, so I thought, we need to get this word out of the room, this museum word. And when I tried, in, in, in different workshops, tried to come at the same problem without using that word museum or library or anything, they were just lost. They didn't know how to organize their thoughts. Um, and after, we, we, we talked to them some after, the, after they'd been done uh, building models. We asked them about this. Tell me about the word museum. What does that mean? They went, ah, boring, ah. What about a library? They immediately went, shh, which <laughs> amazed me. It's such a trope, um, shh. Uh, but then I said, um, we started asking them, tell, tell us about places you go. You know, what, what kind of cool places do you go that you love? And they started going, oh, there's this place downtown. We love this place. We go there every day after school. We do homework. We listen to music. Um, we hang out. It's great. I said, what is it called? They said, I, I don't know. It's just that, that place. They looked at each other. They didn't know what it's called. After the workshop, uh, someone there, an adult said, that's their library. <laughs> they all go to their library every day after school. They love it. But they don't think of it as a library. It's that place. And we started asking more questions at other workshops. There's a wonderful science uh, museum north of Copenhagen called the Experimentarium. Um, we learned they've all been there. They all love it. They go as much as they can, but they don't think of it as a museum. It's just that place. So what I realized in this uh, series of workshops was that while people don't like the idea of a museum in the abstract, very few people think about museums in the abstract. I mean, we do, and that's it. Instead, people have uh, built affiliations with places that they love based on the experiences they have there. So we gave ourselves permission to use the word museum as a framing device to set some initial expectations about how people might be expected to, how people might expect to receive experiences and participate themselves. But we realized that very quickly we could move beyond any negative impression of the word museum by just creating great experiences. Um, the same thing almost can be said of the UN. <laughs> the UN itself is like a parental figure. Uh, I think when the UN's presence, official presence is in the room, people lean back because it has such authority, such moral authority. Um, people defer to the UN. People aren't playing rock, paper, scissors in the General Assembly building. Um, and Many people at the UN have told us that they think they should. 
Um, so the UN is a framing device. It has convening power in the same way the, a museum does. But very quickly, we can move beyond that kind of framing, uh, framing function to get people really actually interacting with each other around a set of important ideas. And thank you, children of Bilund, Denmark, for helping me figure that out. Um, global by default. When you are building a museum that's global by default, you have very different kinds of conversations. Um, and uh, Chris Anderson and Tim O'Reilly, some of the pioneers in digital thinking, have had, I think it's one of the what is web 2.0 uh, canonical ideas, global by default, for everyone connected, global by default. And there's no reason why your institutions can't be global by default as well. It forces you to think very differently about what you do, where the value flows, and then bottom up and at eye level. When we started analyzing, although that's a very serious word, <laughs> I don't think we've reached yet a level that's worthy of the term analysis, but when we started trying to understand who was working to connect people and create action around global goals, we saw a very densely populated cluster of organizations and actors who were working with top-down. The UN itself was constructed to be a sort of a government-to-government, -government, like a business-to-business -business kind of organization in the aftermath of World War II. Um, to prevent World War III. And many NGOs, government institutions, um, uh, businesses, institutions function in this sort of B2B, business-to-business -business methodology. Um, but we live increasingly in a peer-to-peer -peer world where many of the problems and much of the opportunity lies in the blank space between the traditional work of institutions and governments. So we thought, we also noticed that, oh, um, brought on also by thinking about Brexit and thinking about the last presidential campaign in the United States, that there was somewhat of a failure of this model of explaining the concepts of modernity from on high down to the grateful public. This language of elites really wasn't, uh, wasn't working so well <laughs> in democracy at the moment. So this is to say we saw a great opportunity we couldn't add much to the work being done government to government, top down, but we felt we could add a lot in that chasm between the work of institutions and the UN and the way people lead their ordinary lives. The architecture of the Sustainable Development Goals presumes that normal, amazing, ordinary people will be involved in this work. It needs people in their communities to do the work um, but there, there's very little architecture there to support normal people becoming involved. And we thought that we could step into that space. So we say bottom up um, or grassroots and at eye level with people everywhere. No jargon, uh, no 150 slide PowerPoint shows, but the kind of language and the kind of body language that people use in their everyday lives. <laughs> we also noticed that among the organizations and actors trying to get people involved in making life better in global citizenship, we saw in one area, quadrant, people working on emotion. One of our co-founders is the Danish Icelandic artist Olafur Eliasson, and one of his signature works is for the Paris Climate Summit in Paris, uh, 2015. He brought icebergs from the Arctic and parked them in the streets of Paris. So you could see global warming happening. You could see an iceberg melting. And they're incredible pictures. They're both formally very beautiful and people are, kids are hugging melting glaciers. It's very emotional. And Olafur feels that you're not likely to take action on an idea unless you feel it in your body. He calls it embodied knowledge. Unless you feel it in your body. It's sort of an emotional knowledge. We also saw people who felt that you had to know about an idea in order to become active in solving it. Social science research kind of proves that that's not true. 
And actually, many times the exact opposite is true. Uh, American middle class, upper middle class, well-educated consumers know more about climate change than almost any group of individuals on Earth. They're the least politically active and engaged in actually solving that topic. And actually, we know sometimes if someone's mental model is, say, they don't believe in climate change, the more information you give them about climate change, the less likely they are to take action. So there's something incomplete about the information awareness model of change. There's something incomplete about the emotional model of change. In another quadrant, we see the maker movement. We see maker spaces. We see hackathons. We see people volunteering. We see this sort of habit of action with bodies that often is disconnected, uh, happens in small scales, happens in local communities without much awareness of uh, how these individual kinds of efforts support each other and connect to greater good. So we saw a lot of opportunity um, uh, in trying to connect, we would say, the heart, the emotion, the mind, the intellect, and then the hands, the, the doing in one, uh, one kind of effort. Uh, and we talked about this, about building a bridge between awareness and action, or building a bridge between the work and values of the United Nations and the way people lead their lives in their local communities. Hmm. This became, actually, let me skip forward one slide there. Um, <laughs> there's a, a a beloved American science fiction television show called Star Trek. And one of the mesmerizing things about this show is Captain Kirk and the Doctor and Spock with the ears, they have this thing called the tricorder. And it's this magical diagnostic tool that you can kind of hold up to anything and see if it's, you hold it up to a person, you see if they're sick or healthy. If you hold it up to a rock, you see what it's made of. If, there's one scene where the, the Doctor holds it up on a culture and he can, tell that the, he can tell the health of the culture. It's kind of this amazing device. Um, and uh, so we've been looking for the equivalent of that tool to help us understand what we were doing with UN Live and what, how we could uh, diagnose and understand different kinds of projects that happen in, in museums so we could kind of tune them to our theory of change. Um, and this has really, been a really valuable one, and it's one that I think is, can be very powerful in your own organizations. Uh, this matrix comes from Ethan Zuckerman at MIT. He's the director of the Center for Civic Media at MIT. And this is about how civic participation in mostly in political processes works. In the upper left corner, you have, well, the quadrant is thin, Interaction, you know, thumbs upping something on Facebook, and thick interaction, small study groups in a local pub or a living room, you know, a, a lesson in your, in your galleries. Uh, and then symbolic impact and impactful impact. So Ethan says top left corner, thin and symbolic, that's liking a cause on Facebook. That's retweeting. We see, um, if you support the global goals, retweet this. You know, that's great. Those things get to tremendous internet scale, you know, sometimes hundreds of millions of retweets. But ultimately, it's not about directly about change. It's about a feeling of, of awareness and participation and scale. Um, and uh, sometimes people call that the slacktivism quadrant, like slacker and activism, the slacktivism quadrant. If you move over to thin and impactful, Ethan says that voting in most democracies is designed to be thin and impactful. Thin because there's an architecture around it that's supposed to make it easy. You go, you cast your ballot, somebody takes care of the rest of the details. But impactful, strangely, I think because it has infrastructure underneath it. It has supported laws, governments, armies, constitutions, decades or generations of, of civil, civic habits. Um, so it can be tremendously impactful. And a little clue to where we're heading, I think there's a cultural infrastructure, a participatory infrastructure that's missing 
often that can connect people in cultural settings with longer term, more impactful outcomes. Lower left quadrant, symbolic and, symbolic and thick, he says is the Occupy movement would be an example of that. People are in very small groups, working closely together for year after year after year. Sometimes this is um, digitally supported real world activism. So people are often meeting in, in um, at, at Google, they call them pizza groups. You know, groups you can feed with two pizzas, 10, 12 people. Um, but not after any particular social outcome or policy goal. And then on the other side, thick and impactful. He says when Hurricane Sandy hit the east coast of the United States a few years ago, the most effective on the ground relief agency wasn't the Red Cross, it wasn't the National Guard, it was the members of the Occupy movement because they'd already practiced being together, working in close quarters, they knew each other in a deep sense. So when, they, when a need was perceived in society, they were able to react faster and more effectively than anyone else. They practiced citizenship in a way. Um, and I think the challenge for us and in our institutions in, I'll say, in a very glib way, in a time of great need, is how to connect this thin and symbolic interaction that can potentially reach hundreds of millions or billions of people with this deep, thick, and impactful kind of change interaction where change is very likely, where behavior change is very likely, where people are asking each other to participate and become involved. Um, so, flying to Copenhagen for a workshop to design uh, the, the architect's brief for our building competition, I got this idea to try and make our own tricorder for UN Live, so we could assess ideas We'd written a 20, 30 page content strategy that's very rich, it's online, read it, please comment on, us, on it, help us understand it. Um, but it was hard for people to visualize all these words. Um, how could we put that in action? How could we understand our own work and what we could do better? So this tricorder um, uh, we created, one tool is the Zuckerman quadrant, so you hold up Go to your local exhibition, go to your local education workshop. Where does it fall? Where do you want it to fall in this matrix? Is it okay if it's thin and, uh, um, thin and uh, symbolic? What could you do as a designer to make it more impactful, to drag it over towards the other side of the graph? Um, I like the idea of uh, using sort of tactile metaphors for some of these things, so I liked the color wheel idea and thought we could have a color wheel, a palette of head, hands, and heart. Look at any given project. Where does it fall? What, what colors does it draw mostly from? Of course, these aren't uh, mutually exclusive properties, but as a designer, as a leader, as a project leader, as someone who deals with the public, could we, could we add elements that draw more from emotional knowledge? Uh, could we support the knowing of something with just doing? Many people who, uh, social scientists particular, particularly, who commented on our content strategy, advised us that not to think in terms of knowing something, becoming active, accomplishing something, that sometimes that arrow runs the other way. People are capable of doing and becoming enthusiastically active before they really have a greater intellectual understanding of what it is they're working on. Um, a series of sliders. Is that project top-down? Are we lecturing to a passive audience? What would happen if we moved that slider towards bottom-up? If we co-created with an audience? If we listened, if we put them on the stage instead of ourselves? How could that work? What would we, what would we have to do to make that happen? Passive and active? Sometimes it's great to be passive. I love being passive in a gallery. Um, uh, it's a spectacular experience most of the time, but what could opportunities be to make my experience in a museum or online more, more active, to involve me in different ways, to make me laugh and play? Um, part of the infrastructure that institutions can provide is continuity. 
to weave together individual episodes of audience engagement or ideas into a larger, more sustained project to create a common good. So when we conceive of a, a piece of content for UN Live or you do in your museum, can you weave it into something that lasts longer, that supports ongoing thinking, different kinds of reaction, uh, different kinds of engagement with your audiences? How playful, how playful is it? You know, are Pippi's parents in the room staring down at you? Um, are there ways we can play with larger ideas? I've struggled with this because some of the, the many of the ideas that we're dealing with in UN Live, the Sustainable Development Goals, are very dire. I mean, people are dying. <laughs> people are starving. It's really bad. And is it doing them a disservice to use the imagination and play? And in the workshops that we did in, in, in Ethiopia and uh, Brazil, we heard very soundly, no, it's not a disservice, that the greatest disservice is lack of dialogue, lack of voice, <laughs> um, lack of engagement of any kind with the real lived experiences of, of different kinds of people around the world. Um, oh, the spinach cookie deserves some, a special mention. I was the proud co-creator of one of the first educational museum games online called Meet Me at Midnight, and it was a mystery children's game to teach kids about American art. And uh, we thought it was very irreverent and risky and uh, edgy and that our curator and, and director would hate it, and we presented it to the director, and she sort of looked at it and she said, too much spinach, not enough cookie meaning you're trying to provide nutrition for the grateful children, and it's not enough joy. It's not enough play. Um, I thought that was very empowering, and that's a, a key question we ask ourselves in, in meetings at UN Live. Is there enough cookie on the table? Um, there needs to be some spinach, but not too much and not too quickly. Um, a little bit on locality and scale as well. But you get the idea here. And I, I, as I was composing this, I realized I'd left off maybe the most important dial. Are we, are we connecting awareness and action? You know, how, if, if that's a, like a Geiger counter, if you held it up on something, is, is action happening? Is active learning happening? Is participatory learning happening? And are we actually accomplishing something towards solving global challenges? So, using a dashboard like this, have you heard of the Model UN program? It's this revered diplomacy simulation that I think between 500 and 700,000 kids do around the world every year. It's considered to be kind of out of date, using a model of diplomacy that is uh, much more about the mid-20th century than about uh, goal and task-oriented collaboration and consensus building that happens in the UN now. Um, some, in the hands of the right teacher and the right group, it's incredibly inspiring and formative, but many kids say, yeah, you get, you get points for dressing well and speaking in turn, and it's kind of lame, actually. Um, so we've been going through an exercise, how could we, with our mission, <laughs> and our devotion to play and emotion and, and tactile doing things that matter, how could we reinvent something like the Model UN? What would happen if we moved various parts of those dials to 10, to 11, if you know Spinal Tap, <laughs> to go to, set it to 11, set it to stun? Um, and through that work, we're going to open a physical building in Copenhagen in 2023, but we can't wait. You know, the global goals can't wait for that. The global goals, 17 global goals, 169 targets to meet by 2030. We can't tread water waiting to open a bricks and mortar building in Copenhagen and then start doing our work. So what could we do now to lift off this institution using these principles, using the global vision, bottom up, connected, eye level? And we came up with a lift off on three platforms. First, uh, to launch a YouTube network or a, a digital video network. I'm using YouTube as a code word for sort of a busy, connected video environment. Um, we're going to launch a global competition to se select nine video bloggers 
from local communities around the world. Three will initially focus on people on the move, which is the term of art for refugees, migrants, and displaced people. Um, there are 65 million displaced people, people on the move in the world now, one out of every, uh, what is it? I can't do the math right now, but you know, 100 people in the world is, a, is now a displaced person. So three focusing on that, but not, not as policy analysts, but how working with people on the move looks and feels to normal people, normal in making their communities better. Three vloggers will focus on climate change. Through these two issues, we feel that we can tell a story about all of the sustainable development goals. They all weave through those two concepts. Um, uh, and then three wild card vloggers. One of them may be about humor. Uh, one of them may be about data science. How do I understand, as a, as, a, as a global citizen now, how do I think about information and data? One of them may focus on scientific literacy. We don't know exactly yet, but we'll, we'll run a global competition over many months to identify these vloggers, the video bloggers. And you may think of it as American Idol or what's, there's a European equivalent of these kind of talent competitions. And by far the least interesting thing about those competitions is who wins. The journey of it is what's so exciting and interesting. Meeting new people, seeing human creativity on stage. That's the ethos we want to aspire to. So that gets us to high scale, the potential of reaching, interacting with hundreds of millions or billions of people. But we also know we need to be down in real communities, down in that pizza group. So we're going to stage a series of, we call them global local events a local festival week with partners, say, in Rio de Janeiro, where Friday night is an Ignite talk, or Pecha Cucha, or TEDx, with the young, smart innovators. Saturday and Sunday start with family programs, going into workshops and meetups, going into uh, food trucks, more formal performances and lectures, and then a formal, highly produced event in the Saturday night. All of these are designed to kind of put a spotlight on local people, local ideas, local perspectives, local vocabulary, um, uh, and to begin to build a network of people who are thinking and acting in similar ways, or to, for, for us to begin to get a sense of who is out there uh, and what they're doing. And of course, all of this is intrinsically both festival and community celebration, but it's also content. This is where digitality comes in. Everything's webcast, everything's vlogged, everything's blogged. It becomes a, a demonstration of how everyone can participate in UN Live and what the next city is capable of doing. And then finally, we want to give ourselves a pretext to do something with play. So we've come up with the idea of a year-long, see if I can get it right, a science fiction climate change mystery game. So maybe uh, the best way to explain it is on a given day, a few thousand schools around the world receive fragments of a mysterious encrypted message from outer space that seems to indicate that an alien technology has been turned on that dramatically accelerates climate change to a thousand times its current speed. And you have to solve the puzzle or we're all gonna die. But your school in Yotabori gets a message and the kids, the teacher says, I don't know what this is. He's very coy about it. The kids can figure it out. But their message is in Portuguese. And the kids in Rio, their message is in French. And the kids in France, their message is in Mandarin Chinese. And we begin to get this kind of rolling global event where we in the middle don't announce the rules or how to solve the problems, but we provide a series of breadcrumbs that are structured around building collaboration building new kinds of connections around solving global goals. Maybe one of the exercises is you show up to work one morning and someone has chalked around your, your school building where sea level will be by the end of the day. So what do you do? Well, it just so happens that we've brought in the head of your local disaster planning agency, the hydrologist at the university who understands how flood and water works. You have 20 minutes to design your emergency response kit. Oh no, halfway through someone says, oh, it's 10 minutes till water rises. You find out that the, an elderly person in the local retirement community has the key clue for you because she lived through the last bad flood in your city. 
and then nobody on Earth gets to unlock the next puzzle clue until 20, 200, 2,000 communities have solved their local challenges. So this kind of gameplay, largely improvisational, it's connected to the serious games movement um, about finding new kinds of collaborative civic capacity. It's very digital, it's also very physical and very participatory. In just a few minutes, I'll drop you through some reference projects that inspire us to give you a concrete idea of what we're, what we're seeing with our tricorder, what we're seeing with our radar, and I'll really, I'll really blow through these. Um, South Bank Center in London, program, it's a sprawling arts complex with a symphony, I think, in a library, public space, and they program these week-long festivals throughout the year. It's a festival programming model. The Women of the World Festival is the best known, and you can see the, the body language. Um, lower right-hand corner is a stand-up comedian. <laughs> um, these uh, very tactile, um, tactical workshops happening. And then I think, I never have learned what this is, but something about hula hoops. You know, a hula, what a wonderful thing. You bring your child and you don't have to be cerebral all day long. There's something about hula hooping. I'll find out what that story is someday. Um, another great example is there's a theater group in New York called Improv Everywhere. They did an MP3 experiment. 3,000 people downloaded the same audio file and agreed to show up at Battery Park in New York at the same hour, at the same day, and hit play. And each uh, two groups each got different sets of instructions that choreographed this rolling citywide play festival during the day. It's an example of kind of public spectacle and public playfulness, seeing each other um, to build trust and uh, have joy that's very inspiring to us. Creative Mornings, um, Meetup, you know, meetup.com. Meetup is a fabulous, if you want, ever get depressed about humanity, go to Meetup and see the thousands and thousands of things that normal people organize themselves to do day in and day out. Um, I mentioned Olafur Eliasson's Ice Watch. Uh, this connection between global and local, I'm beginning to think there's no such thing as global. Global's just a lot of local. It's just a lot of connected local. Um, there's a, nah, I won't tell that story. If you want, I'll tell you the story during question and answer. Humans of New York was one photographer taking pictures of his neighborhood. Uh, those local stories resonated and it's built into a global movement that often raises money and uh, channels action towards social causes. One of my favorite projects ever is the Human Library. It started in Copenhagen in the 70s, but you can go to an event, you can go to your local library. Toronto Public Library did one. And you check out a neighbor, like they're a book. They're in the card catalog. You check out a Buddhist monk, a sex worker turned politician, the mayor. Maybe you check out the Secretary General of the UN and you have a conversation. Uh, it's very local, it's about empathy and understanding, and it's also through a sort of a franchise model, scaling to a tremendous degree. It's, it's a hugely sympathetic and compassionate kind of project. Um, we heard, even in the, the most dire circumstances in Rio de Janeiro, people who, who one person in particular who was in desperate physical need of a house, a job, food, health care for her baby, said how important dialogue and understanding was for her. Nobody understands. Um, no one understands me. There's one guy, and she pointed to the guy who was a social worker uh, who was in the room. Pedro understands. He's an angel. Pe why is Pedro only one in a million? And after 20, 30 minutes of talking, we asked, would it be okay if, if our museum, if the only thing that happened from our museum was there could be two Pedros? She said, yeah, that would be okay. That'd be good. That's, so that's sort of my goal. We're going to have two Pedros. That seems doable. Um, that's a little... Trade school. I'm very, we're very interested in non-monetary forms of value exchange. 
trade school is a clever project. Um, teachers, people who know things, offer to teach classes, and learners uh, find their teachers, but no one can pay anyone else. The teacher says, I know, I'll teach you C++ programming, but I need four dozen cookies for my son's bake sale. So you need to bake a dozen cookies to come to my class. Um, and learners in this environment say that they benefit more from this kind of uh, trusted peer relationship with the teacher than they do in any class they've ever paid for. It's also a way of, I talked about the infrastructure that makes thin interaction impactful. Um, the trade school provides a platform for calling up that kind of civic talent. Maybe your neighbor knows something, maybe your other neighbor needs to know something, but there are very few institutions that step forward and try and make that connection tangible and also joyful. Hmm. Oh, there's just a lot of good stuff. Um, evidence of play, I talked about the game. Um, you may have heard of escape rooms, um, mystery dinner theater, um, you know, uh, scavenger hunts. There are lots of examples of these kinds of things happening. The, Washington, the newspaper in Washington, D.C. used to do a day-long scavenger hunt. They'd got three or 4,000 people to come and run around the city like madmen. Um, there's a thirst for this kind of public conviviality uh, that is often hidden because no one is there to make the ask. Um, this is another form of non-monetary um, transaction. There's a, a ex marketing experiment where you can't buy a Coke machine. You can't buy a Coke from this Coke machine. It will only give you a Coke if you do a dance. There's a sensor in the Coke machine, and so the public spectacle of, you know, in a mall of sullen teens walking by, all of a sudden now it's this active, vibrant, civic space. Um, we think uh, maybe you can't buy a ticket, to UN Live in Copenhagen, but maybe if you learn something, maybe if you do a dance, it'll let you in. Uh, maybe there's a touch screen at the entrance. You can't buy your own ticket, but I can buy a ticket for David at UN Live in Jotobori. Um, we think that these kinds of value exchanges will be uh, reduce the feeling that we're just paying for an experience and increase the feeling that we can be there for each other. And finally, where do I want to end? Of course, there's the maker movement, which is extraordinary. Um, <laughs> last, last, last moment on this, um, to think about institution building. You know, we know through 20 years of software development, is we know that most designers are wrong. Your first guess about how something works is wrong. We know that in museums, I feel very confident in saying that in museums, we have an idea when we design an exhibit of what how the visitor will react and interact with the content. And every study I've seen shows it's almost always something different that happens. Um, people come on their terms to mix in their own life experience, their needs, what they know, how they share and learn with whatever it is you've happened to, to present, and we're okay with that. Um, and one of the temptations of creating a new, important global institution, or any institution, everyone wants you to decide what it's going to be as early as possible. Uh, and that's a mistake, especially with something that's so global, so close to the, the lived experience of millions and millions and millions of people. There's a danger in locking down the problem space too soon. This is a picture of the beloved Building 20 on the MIT campus. It was uh, loved by everyone who worked there. It was just a horse stable. It's just a wooden shed on the revered campus of MIT. Um, but people loved it because they could change it. If you had a new piece of equipment in your uh, lab and it didn't fit in your room, you could just saw a hole in the ceiling. Um, people felt it was on a human scale. They related to the materials. It was wood. It was. Um, uh, you know, soft floors, and the building could get better at suiting the needs of its inhabitants over time. And I think, I think that about that architecture a lot with UN Live, that it's important to do things early, to learn who will participate and how, but not to set the architecture, the digital architecture, the network architecture, the architecture of participation too early, to let it emerge. 
It's very much an emergent change model. And it's a balancing act for all of you, I know, um, to please a sponsor, to please a city, a state, a patron who's used to what you used to do in the 20th century while also being true to what we think are the new and very challenging needs of citizens in the 21st century. And on that note, maybe I'll stop talking exactly on time, but I'll thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for a very inspirational talk. And I think we have time for one question. Anyone wants to ask a question? I mean, there's so many, so many thoughts and so many questions, and I'm sure that you will be available for discussion. In the, will. But I was thinking about when you go to these, you know, to the local communities all over the world with, you know, pop-up museums yeah. and all your activities. Do you bring your concept, or do you negotiate a new kind of concept for each new space, mm -hmm. each new place? How does that work? Yeah, um, our our hope. I think that what we're developing is a, an empty frame, a framework for participation, and designed to be general and flexible enough to be able to adapt to most circumstances, but also knowing it won't adapt to all of them. Um, but it's empty. And that's very confusing to a lot of people. Um, uh, so uh, the idea of a festival, a festival doesn't. A festival in Rio de Janeiro may look very different than one in Addis Ababa. It may look very different from one in Yotabori. Um, uh, and the trick is allowing, relying, assuming that local organizers, people who are passionate about the general ideas locally, will take the lead, and our job will be to serve them as they fill this empty frame with their own ideas and passions and make it their own. Um, some of the, so if you talk to a social scientist, they will say there's no universal, nothing will work everywhere, and, nothing, and some social scientists will say nothing will work anywhere, um, which is quite discouraging. But so far we found um, a great deal of enthusiasm. People want to be together, they want to see each other in the public life, they want to make their own communities better, and they want to do good in the world, but there are very few people who have sort of asked them please do this, and shined a light on them, made them the heroes of the story as they do. And, and that's where we're going to start. Two or three years from now, it may look different, but that's where we're going to start. And that really opens up the possibility for negotiating the impact on the individual level, the local, and the global. Absolutely, I guess. absolutely. So thanks again. You're Thank very you very welcome. much. You're very Thank welcome. You. Thank you. <laughs> so we will, we will give, I mean, mm. every presenter will get this gift. And it's a book, so the National Archives in Sweden turning 400 years this year. So this is a snapshot, so you can walk through the archives, the 400 years history of the archive. I love it. And there's also a coffee, coffee cup here. And I know that it's really coffee friendly, because I ha had one when I presented here two years ago. So you will be good for you. Thank okay. you so much. Thank, thank you again. very much. Yeah, thank you.